Hello and welcome, my name is William, and today we're going to talk about using a breadth first search to find the shortest path on a grid. This is going to be a really fun video because we're going to solve a problem and I'm going to teach you a bunch of handy tricks when doing graph theory on grids. Before we get started, I highly recommend my video introducing the breadth first search algorithm. Make sure you understand the basics of a breadth first search before continuing because we will be building off the topics of those concepts. There should be a link in the description for the last video. The motivation behind why we're learning about grids in this video is that a surprising number of problems can easily be represented using a grid, which a lot of the times turns into a graph theory problem. Grids are interesting because they're a form of implicit graph, which means that we can determine a node's neighbors based on our location within the grid. For instance, finding a path through a maze is a form of a grid problem. You're trying to get from one side of the maze through the other. Well, you need to find a path. It's a pathfinding problem. Or perhaps you're a person trying to navigate your way through obstacles such as trees, rivers, and rocks to get to a particular location. And this can be modeled using a grid and in turn we end up using graph theory to navigate around. A common approach to solving graph theory problems on grids is to first convert the grid to a familiar format such as an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix so we can easily work with them. However, this isn't always the most efficient technique, but we'll get to that. Suppose we have a grid on the left and we want to represent it as both an adjacency list and an adjacency matrix. What do we do first? First, you should label all the cells in the grid with the numbers 0 through n non-inclusive, where n is the product of the number of rows and columns. So in this grid on the left, there are six cells, so I labeled each cell with the numbers 0 through 6 non-inclusive. Then we actually want to construct an adjacency list and an adjacency matrix based off this grid. The adjacency list doesn't require any setup because it's simply a map that we initialize, but the adjacency matrix requires us to initialize a matrix of size 6 by 6 to represent our graph. There are six rows and six columns in the new adjacency matrix because it's how many nodes there are in the grid we're trying to represent. Assuming edges are unweighted and cells connect left, right, up, and down, node 0 connects with node 1 and node 2, which we reflect in the adjacency list and adjacency matrix on the right. Then node 1 connects to node 0 and node 3, node 2 to nodes 0, 3, and 4, node 3 with nodes 1, 2, and 5, and so on. And that's basically how you convert a grid to an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix. Once we have an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix, we are able to easily run whatever specialized graph algorithm we need to solve our problem, such as finding the shortest path, finding connected components, etc. However, transformations between graph representations can usually be avoided due to the structure and the nature of a grid. Let me explain. Suppose we're the red ball in the middle and we know we can move left, right, up, and down to reach adjacent cells. Well, mathematically, if we're the red ball at the row column coordinate r, c, we can add the row vectors minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, minus 1 to reach all the adjacent cells. If the problem you're trying to solve allows moving diagonally, then you can also use the row vectors minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. Using row vectors makes it easy to access neighboring cells from the current row column position. First, define the direction vectors for north, south, east, and west, broken down into their row column components. Then what we want to do is loop over each direction vector and add it to the current position. Here I iterate i from 0 to 4 non-inclusive because we only have 4 directions. Then add the row direction to the current row to make rr, 
the variable representing the new row and then add the column direction to the current column to make CC the new column position. So the new position on the grid RR comma CC is an adjacent cell. However, it might not be an adjacent cell if we're on the border of the grid and the new position is out of bounds. So we check that the new coordinate is within our grid by making sure that the new row column position is greater than or equal to zero and doesn't exceed the number of rows and columns of our grid, respectively. So if those two checks pass, then we know that the new position RR comma CC is a neighboring cell of our current position where the red ball was R comma C. So in summary, this technique is really nice, really easy to code, and actually naturally extends to higher dimensions. So let's solve a shortest path problem on a grid using the direction vector technique we just learned about. So here's an abridged problem statement that you might encounter during an interview or in a programming competition. And it goes as follows. Suppose you're trapped inside a 2D dungeon and need to find the quickest way out. The dungeon is composed of unit cubes, which may or may not be filled with a rock. It takes one minute to move one unit north, south, east, or west. You cannot move diagonally and the maze is surrounded by solid rock on all sides. This problem statement is an easier version of the problem Dungeon Master on the Caddis Online Judge. See the problem link in the description. The dungeon is a grid of size R by C, and you start at the node with an S character, and there's an exit at the cell with an E. A cell full of rock is indicated by a pound sign or a hashtag, and empty cells are represented using a dot. In this particular setup, it's possible to escape the dungeon using this particular route highlighted in green. Remember that we want the shortest path to escape the dungeon, not just any path. Our approach is going to be to do a breadth first search from the start node until we reach the end node and count the number of cells we traverse during that process. However, it might not be possible to exit the dungeon if we cannot reach the exit, so we'll have to be mindful of that. So like in any breadth first search, we need to start by visiting our start node and adding it to the queue. Assuming we've already found the coordinate of our starting node within the grid, we can add it to the queue. Then we visit the adjacent unvisited neighbors and add them to the queue as well. And continue this process all the while avoiding adding rock cells to the queue. So I'll let the animation play and meanwhile try and predict which cells will be visited next. All right, after we find our end cell, we know how many steps it takes to get from the start to the end. Notice that we didn't even visit all the cells in the grid. The bottom right cell is still unvisited, so it's possible that we terminate early. If you're interested in actually finding the path itself rather than just the number of steps it takes to escape the dungeon, then you'll need to keep track of the previously visited node for each node. Go and rewatch the last video if you need a refresher on how to do that. I want to talk a little bit about the way we are representing states in our breadth first search. So far, we have been storing the next xy position in the queue as an xy pair. This works well, but requires an array or an object wrapper to store the coordinate values. In practice, this can require a lot of packing and unpacking of values to and from our queue. Let's look at an alternative approach which also scales well in higher dimensions and in my opinion requires less setup and effort. So the alternative approach I'm suggesting is to use one queue for each dimension. So in a three-dimensional grid, you would have one queue for each of the x, y, and z dimensions. Suppose we're enqueuing the coordinate x1, y1, z1. 
then we would simply place each coordinate in their respective queues. So the x coordinate goes in the x queue, the y goes in its own y queue, and so on. As we need to keep enqueuing different positions, we simply keep filling up these queues this way. This contrasts the approach of simply having one queue with each of the components packed away inside an object. The one thing we have to be mindful about, however, is that when we either enqueue or dequeue elements, you need to enqueue and dequeue elements from each of the queues all at the same time. So when I dequeue or pull elements from the queue, I need to remove an element from each of these queues. I prefer this representation when working with multidimensional coordinates, which is why I want to share it. Try it out and see if it works for you. So now that we have all the knowledge we need, we can solve the dungeon problem. Let's look at some pseudocode. Assume that I have already read in the input matrix into memory and did some pre-processing to find the coordinate of the starting node. The first two variables are the constants R and C, the number of rows and columns in the input matrix. Following this is M, the input character matrix of size R by C. Next are two variables, S, R, and S, C, the row column position of the starting node. We'll need this to start our breadth first search. RQ and CQ are two Q data structures that represent the row Q and the column Q will be enqueuing and dequeuing elements from during the breadth first search. This next set of variables is to keep track of the number of steps taken to reach the exit. Move count will actually track the number of steps taken. Nodes left in layer tracks how many nodes we need to dequeue before taking a step. And nodes in next layer tracks how many nodes we added in the breadth for search expansion so that we can update nodes left in layer accordingly in the next iteration. This will make more sense soon. Reached end tracks whether or not we have reached the end cell marked with an E. We're also going to make use of a visited matrix, the same size as the input grid, to track whether or not a cell has been visited, since we do not want to visit a cell multiple times. And lastly, I define the north, south, east, and west direction vectors. To solve the dungeon problem, this is all the code we'll need to execute our breadth for search and reach the exit. The first thing I do is add the start cells row and column values to the row queue and column queue. Then don't forget to mark the start cell as visited because we don't want to go there again. We're not done our breadth first search until both of our queues are empty. I check that the size of the row queue is greater than zero, but you can also check that the size of the column queue is greater than zero, since their sizes should always be in sync. Then, since I know the queues aren't empty, I can dequeue the current position from the queues as the row position R and the column position C. Then I check if we've reached the dungeon exit by checking if the current character in the grid is an E. If it is, then mark that we've reached the exit and break out early. Otherwise, we're not done exploring and we want to add all the valid neighbors of the current node to the queue. I wrote a function called explore neighbors that'll do just that. Let's have a look. Here we are inside the explore neighbors method. This is where we'll be using the direction vector technique we learned about earlier. Since cells have four directions we care about, north, south, east, and west, I loop i from 0 to 4, non-inclusive. Compute the new coordinate rr, comma cc by adding the direction vector to the current position. Make sure the new position is actually within the grid because we could end up with positions like 0, comma, minus 1, which is out of bounds. Even if the new position is within the grid, that does not guarantee that it is a valid position. The position might already have been visited previously, or it could be a blocked off cell, such as a cell that isn't traversable and full of rock. If both of those conditions aren't true, then we can enqueue the new position to visit it later. When enqueuing a new position, we are going to visit, make sure to mark it as visited now, 
so that it doesn't get added to the queue multiple times in the future. Also increment the number of nodes in the next layer, which we'll be needing shortly. This next block of code is used to track the number of steps we took getting to the dungeon exit. Every time we finish a layer of nodes, we increment the number of steps taken. We know how many nodes are in each layer because we kept track of that in the explore neighbors method. When the number of nodes on the current layer reaches zero, we know to increment the move count. At the end, if we are able to reach the exit, we return the move count, otherwise we return minus one to indicate that the dungeon exit was not reached. So in summary, things we learned in this video are how to represent a grid as an adjacency list and an adjacency matrix, how to use direction vectors to visit neighboring cells, we explored an alternative way of representing multidimensional coordinates with multiple cues. And lastly, we looked at how to use a breadth first search on a grid to find the shortest path between two cells. Thank you for watching. Please like this video if you learned something and subscribe for more mathematics and computer science videos.